there is so much out there to get mad about. Social injustices, class warfare, continued colonization, the act of destruction of our planet by those focused on profits and not people. We can find it overwhelming at times. The good news is there are equally as many, if not more, stories of people coming together and rising up against the forces at play. So the creators of Blueprints of Disruption have added a new weekly segment, Ravel Rants, where we will unpack the stories that have us most riled up, share calls to action, and most importantly, celebrate resistance. I'm pretty annoyed right now at another display of media failing their responsibilities at accurately portraying what is happening on the ground, whether it's on the ground in Israel-Palestine or on the streets of Toronto, the streets across Canada. Media continues to fail to perform good journalism. And what really pissed me off this week was, you know, after the latest attack in Gaza, in the incredibly densely populated city of Rafa, a city that's not supposed to be nearly as densely populated as it is, but where over one, at least 1.4 million people are crammed in along the border, a place where it's supposed to be safe, where Israel told people to evacuate to, is now being attacked. That triggered a protest uh, this past Monday in Toronto, beginning at the Israeli embassy at Young and Bloor and ending off at Young and Dundas Square, walking around a lot of different landmarks across the city. I went out because I wanted to to cover this, to cover it into a story, which didn't end up working out for me. But I was shocked the next day to see the narratives that were going around on social media. Uh, and eventually, beyond social media, it was going around on the articles of many of our largest platforms, that supposedly this protest targeted Mount Sinai Hospital. I cannot emphasize this enough. That's not what happened. I was there. That that is not what happened. Some of the folks are using the word targeted, and that's been repeated many, many times over. You know, Trudeau, Jigmeet, Olivia Chow, and then plus your usual suspects. But Bonnie Crombie, I think, took the cake here. And this is kind of the image that I think other people are having of this protest. We're going to hear from you of exactly what happened. But I got to read Bonnie Crombie's tweet. The Ontario Liberal leader, right? She's a hopeful for Premier. She says, I've been torn up by the accounts of protesters infiltrating Mount Sinai Hospital, intimidating Jewish patients and doctors and threatening our already weakened healthcare system. Not only did you have the, you know, targeting a Jewish hospital, which is problematic in itself, calling that a Jewish hospital when it's publicly funded. Besides, it wasn't targeted. But she she implies that people went in the hospital and were threatening patients with like violence and somehow led to a lesser level of care within that hospital and like that just she still has this up days later when firsthand accounts are readily available and then that's what people are imagining i can't emphasize enough the hypocrisy where once again the standards we see them unequally applied here because you know full criticism to bonnie crony but there's many more politicians who jumped on this bandwagon be it Justin Trudeau, Olivia Chow, Doug Ford, Marco Mancino, whatever, however you pronounce his name, right? Now, when we want to talk about who's attacking hospitals, a hospital in Rafa was just shelled. So we know Israel attacks hospitals. They've attacked multiple hospitals. We know that. And you haven't seen the condemnation for that. You know, uh, you know, Doctors Without Borders has been talking non-stop about the, the the attacks on medical institutions in Gaza. L- let's talk about Ontario hospitals for a second. Who's attacking Ontario hospitals? Doug Ford put out a statement. He hasn't stopped attacking Ontario hospitals with his policies. 
freezing the wages of nurses, uh, failing to invest adequate funds in hospitals. You want to talk about who is a legitimate threat to our medical institutions? The same guy that is complaining about people climbing outside. But anyways, let's let's get into like, you know, how this actually happened, because I was there when there wasn't anyone at Young and Dundas. You know, I got there about an hour early, saw the crowds, you know, build up at a certain point. People were and this happened really early on. People were uh, because Young and Dundas, uh, sorry, uh, Young and Bloor is under a lot of construction. Uh, so there was tons of scaffolding. People were climbing from the very beginning. I climbed some scaffolding to get some good pictures, you know. Good for you. That's impressive. And that is not unique to that rally. No. If anybody's been, there's always someone climbing a lamp post. Spider-Man is not even new to the scene himself. Spider-Man with a Palestinian flag, like I think it's that image above the hospital awning that has people allowing people to frame it as though there was stoppage there, that it was a rally outside of there. And and witnesses have described this, the Spider-Man went on all the buildings, all the lamp posts. There's a lot of photos. It's just like a distraction, right? They have grabbed this and really manufactured it out of nothing. I thought we had seen it all. Honestly, like an overpass, you can make an argument for safety. And we've seen every kind of bullshit anti-Semitism claims thrown at folks. But I felt like this really was manufactured out of nothing. Like yeah. Toronto police directed the route. That's a classic place to end up, by the way. L- let's talk about Toronto police. Yeah, let's. Because near the beginning, one of the police officers who was there uh, was talking to someone with a megaphone. I don't think they were one of the organizers. They didn't claim to be one of the organizers. They had a megaphone. And the cop was mentioning they would prefer if people kept off the scaffolding because they've done it plenty of times before. Right. So I heard the cop admit that they were aware that this had happened plenty of times before. The Toronto police know for a fact that this is not new. Right. But anyways, you know, the route, you know, start marching south along Young Street, turn on a college by the Toronto police headquarters. They end up in front of Queen's Park. March south towards what? Well, the American Embassy. On University there. Yeah, it's right beside there. As is Sick Kids Hospital, it's Hospital Row. Toronto Rehab, tons of, like, Hospital Row, yeah. And every little bit, they stop. Why? Because the people at the front and the people at the back are typically tend to march at different paces. You don't want to spread it out too thinly. So they stop every little bit to let people catch up. My favorite part about this is the people who don't understand that are outing themselves as never have fucking marched for anything, right? Like if you, the fact that that has to be explained to a lot of people that yes, okay, you can find footage of people not actually moving their feet at one point, but you were saying like media was there all along. So they saw the stop and go. And and again, it's like not new to this protest at all none of it none of it is unique not the route not the the pace not the shenanigans but they are just so desperate to distract us from what is happening right now right because it's just going to be so horrendous and all of them have been on the wrong side for two or three days now i'm a little put out two or three days now a lot of the toronto organizers specifically are spinning their wheels and using their energy issuing statements trying to pull out the receipts that they didn't do what people are saying they're doing and trying to get their voice out there so to counter this ridiculous narrative and and meanwhile you know in rafa where our eyes should be and it i'm so sick of this shit distracting us yeah but but it is important because I think this is an example that we need to learn from in terms of media coverage. And and I will get to that, right? But so along the route, um, Palestinian Spider-Man, and he's not the only one, by the way. There were plenty of other people climbing things. He's climbing lamps. He climbed a statue. He climbed up a parking lot. He climbed up. I don't even know how he got onto this one rooftop near the Eaton Center. Like, he climbed up on everything. Where do people find the energy? I, I have no idea. Actually, he, he slipped at one point. I was worried. But, yeah, no. In terms of pausing in front of the hospital, I mean, this is a massive crowd. A portion of the crowd, if you stop anywhere along university, a portion of the crowd is going to be stopped in front of the hospital. 
right? And like I said, they were pausing every little bit. Was there people paused in front of that particular hospital? Yes. Uh, I myself was aware that it was a Jewish hospital. It's pretty obvious to me, like the logo. Um, but most people have no idea. There was nothing different, whether it's the chants, whether it's the energy in the crowd, whether it's what the uh, folks on the truck leading uh, the protests were saying. There was nothing unique about that moment whatsoever. Wasn't like it wasn't even the most impressive place Palestinian Spider Man climbed up on, if I'm being honest here. The part that really gets me, because you, you mentioned, you know, the wasted energy here. It's not our fucking job to be correcting things because CP24 was there, City TV was there. Uh, there were plenty of, there was no absence of uh, journalists there. And I noticed CP24 was there the entire time. I saw them multiple times walking around with their cameras, filming. They got a big ass camera with a big ass backpack. And so you would expect, with journalists being there, that they would correct the narrative, right? But no, I saw CP24 publish an article where they quoted, you know, Marco Mancino, Justin Trudeau, Doug Ford. I think they quoted someone from the hospital, and that was it. They didn't talk to any of the organizers, and they did not correct the narrative whatsoever. Eventually, uh, after multiple articles were coming out, eventually, I think it was City News gave a chance for somebody from uh, Toronto for Palestine to go on record about this. But it took a long time, and the story had run away by that point. What is the point in media witnessing thing? Like we talk about that need for media to have access and to bear witness. And what is the point of them being there to bear witness to it all if they can't attest to what they saw with their own eyes? And that goes for Toronto cops, too. They're now investigating it. They're, they're allowing all of this. Well, they love when this happens, right? They can now justify even more. Uh, spending on this, but they're investigating it as a hate crime. They were there. They chose the route. There was no lack of evidence or witnesses to what was happening at the time. It was how it was reshaped afterwards, you know, that ended up, it wasn't any flaw of the organizers. I hope none of them are sitting there also second guessing what routes they can take next time to move faster, to completely avoid certain institutions. And it's now, you know, I myself was there in capacity as a journalist and I um, I wanted to write an article essentially about exploring the implications of the attack on Rafa with the ICJ rulings. I couldn't publish because I didn't have an opposing source. I emailed 15 people. Nobody got back to me. That was what my editor told me. And 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 to be honest, if, if the newspaper is intending to be impartial, it's pretty standard proceeding. It was reasonable. I understand why. I get it. What really pissed me off is that there was no opposing viewpoints whatsoever in the articles that were being published by uh, CP24 and, and various other platforms. They were not being held to the same standard that I was being held to. And, and that's the part that really, really gets to me because we mentioned, you know, the, the double standards. Israel literally infiltrated a hospital with an armed attack team to kill people. Some video. You can see them dressed up as doctors holding assault weapons. They admitted to it. Israel has also attacked multiple hospitals, multiple, including recently in Rafa. No outrage to that from the people who are now saying that this attack of anti-Semitism at Mount Sinai is unacceptable when it's not what happened. But the scrutiny is just not there. There's not the same level of scrutiny. And I saw people were inviting these big platforms. They invited CP24. They invited, you know, whoever would come and and. I get it. But again, this is the importance in making sure that you're inviting independent media that you're reaching out to. And and, and I mean, in, in fairness, I did. I, I interviewed somebody uh, from Palestinian youth movement. Unfortunately, I couldn't use it because, again, my article got canned. But there needs there, there wasn't much in terms of coverage that actually spoke to organizers that actually focused on Rafa. And this successfully took the narrative away from one of the... We're talking about an attack that is so bad that many leaders who have been fairly silent or fairly on the side of Israel are, are expressing concern. Because every, everybody realizes you told 
the people of Gaza, flee to Rafa. Go to Rafa. Rafa safe. I think Rafa is usually what, like a, a tenth or less of the population that it is now? We have to imagine like about 1.4 million people have been displaced to Rafa. So in, in 2014, Rafa had 152,000 people. It has 10 times that. It also has some of the last operating hospitals, if you can call them operating. Nasser Hospital, with which I believe is actually in Khan Yunis, was overrun by Israeli soldiers this week. They indiscriminate executions of patients, bulldozing of graves outside uh, because hospitals are forced to create mass graves outside of their doors because it's not safe to go any further outside of the compound because of sniper activity. The Israeli army are now using parts of the Nasser hospital complex as a staging area for further violence on the displaced people, displaced Palestinians that are in the furthest south part of Gaza. And While politicians, I expect that trash from Trudeau. And, you know, at this point, I expect it from everybody. But uh, Chow and Singh climbing on to that description of it being targeted because like it was such strong, confident language that is just so pathetic, but evident of performance. It just it's all a performance for these politicians. Honestly, people, every single one. No, I have people in my replies saying, what about this person? What about that person? I'm sorry. Absolutely. All of them have to perform the game in front of them or they don't get to play at all. And the fact that the NDP is getting up there and trying to suggest a two state solution in in a motion is evident that they still have no idea how to center Palestinian voices and everything they're doing is just crumbs. They're giving you tiny little crumbs here and there to to stop their members from completely turning on them. But they don't mean any of it. And all of that was evident in Jagmeet's tweet. And I just want to share one quick story on how that is actually very typical of the NDP and Jagmeet in particular, because I was at a protest at York University that had very similar smears leveled against it, you know, the typical shit in which, you know, your your friend Sue Ann Levy there wrote an article that ended up with me being doxxed and just demonized all the organizers of it. And It was like one bullshit report in a Zionist lobby newsletter that blew up and Jagmeet himself immediately parroted whatever Trudeau's statement was. They're so desperate to just like stay step in step with those liberals and and catch anything that falls from them that they didn't bother contacting the many contacts they have within the Palestinian movement or to confirm on what they're even commenting on. Right. Because like firsthand accounts are actually out there on what happened. He didn't do that. He made the same bullshit statement and condemned the anti-Semitic chants that didn't exist. There was no recording of it at, at all, despite everyone having their cameras out on both sides. And it was just this ploy. It's just this ploy to maintain votes. They don't give a shit about the genocide. Yeah. Not one of them was willing to risk anything except Sarah Gemma. Not one of them was willing to risk not even the little crumbs that are thrown to them by leadership. Not even Matthew Green. Yes, he's making statements here and there. And I, because he's the only one, almost everyone is just so grateful. But really, there's a whole lot more that could be done. And and the fact that they get their leader gets to say this with no condemnation from underneath tells you just how weak, mm-hmm. how weak the entire MP Slade is, honestly. Now, we're going to save talking in depth about Olivia Chow and the Toronto Police for a great episode that's coming up in the next few days. But I do want to mention what was happening in the context of this, right? Because Olivia Chow is putting out this statement. The Toronto Police are putting out statements just as they're asking for an increase in budget, right? They're pressuring in, in, in ways that are, uh, well... Uh, in my view, unethical. They won, right? Like, And they won that, right? And that was going on simultaneously. The same day, literally the same day, there was a, a report that came out on Monday in the morning from Amnesty International looking at four Israeli strikes in Rafah, three in December and one of them in January, where 
42 children were killed, 95 civilians, and this was in Rafa, and they found that there was zero evidence or justification that these were in any way justifiable as legitimate military targets, and they're saying it's a war crime. That came out in the morning of attacks that happened before the latest attack on Rafa, because this isn't, there's been attacks on Rafa. I haven't seen very much attention at all drawn to that. You know, there was an article in The Hill, but there was very little attention drawn to that whatsoever, and definitely not from our government. At the same time, a Dutch court ruled that Netherlands was no longer permitted to provide the parts for uh, fighter jets to Israel because of the ICJ ruling. That was happening at the same time as well. Looking at the context of the whole situation, we can see again how our Canadian politicians are just completely failing to look at. I mean, we know why, but they're not looking at what's actually happening. They're not actually concerned in the slightest about whether or not they're going to be held accountable by these ICJ rulings. They should be. Because they're continuing to provide arms. We saw the Maple broke the story, right, about the increase in arms sales to Israel since October 7th. That Maple story has gained very little traction, even though, I mean, it's gained tons of traction in progressive Twitter spaces. But the politicians have failed to mention it whatsoever, even though they have been claiming since the beginning that the only aid Canada has been providing is non-lethal aid. And we, of course, know that... Um, There's no such thing. If you're aiding a military, it is lethal. It, even if you were fucking feeding them, because if they didn't have, then why do they need it, right? If they need it to operate as a lethal entity, then it's lethal. It doesn't have to go through your body. To, to use a sports metaphor, because F1 is on my mind right now, it's like when... A couple seasons ago, Red Bull exceeded the, uh, the the spending cap, and they were like, oh, no, that was just catering. It's like, no, 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 you can look at the catering, but by saying it was catering, you have more money elsewhere to spend on parts on your car. Same kind of deal, right? You give them non-lethal aid, it frees up their ability to spend more money on on weapons, right? And, and for the record, talking about aid... It's been days of Israeli settlers blocking the routes with which humanitarian aid can enter Gaza. If Israel was following the ICJ proceedings, it doesn't matter if it's not the military doing this. There are an obligation to prevent people from blocking that aid. They have to allow that aid to enter because it is possible, according to the ICJ rulings, that there is a genocide and they must do everything in their power to prevent it. I think at this point, though, I know we did an episode on how validating that ruling was, but the very next day, Israel told us that they weren't going to follow any of it, that they did not feel like it applied to them whatsoever because there's been nothing but barbaric violence since then. Hind Rajab, she was a young girl in Khan Yunis in the Gaza Strip. And her mother had called the Red Crescent, the Palestinian Red Crescent, and was actually executed while she was on the phone. And young Hind called back asking for help and described being in a car surrounded by her deceased family members. You can only imagine the horror, and this is with the Israeli army right outside of the vehicle, a tank, as described by the first phone call. The Red Crescent worked with the IDF for days. It eventually took them about two days to send a paramedic unit out there, an ambulance and two paramedics, out to the spot where they believed they'd find Hind in the vehicle. And like I said, arrangements were finally made with the IDF, uh, but they lost contact with the paramedics very soon after they arrived close to the spot that they were going. And days later, so 12 days after Hind called, they found all of them dead, completely obliterated the ambulance as it arrived, and Hind was also gone. These are like real people. These are family members. These are heroes, are paramedics trying to save people and continually being bombed by the IDF. 
we've seen so many ambulances bombed. Like if we're talking about targeting health services, they have admitted to targeting ambulances and we have seen them destroy hospitals. We know there's children being operated on without anesthesia. There are women giving birth via C-section without anesthesia or any aftercare. That's an attack on healthcare. I want to take a minute to talk about Sidra Hasuna. She wanted to be a science teacher. According to her family, she's a relative of uh, the ambassador to the U.S. She was murdered alongside seven more of her family members, including her twin sister and her 15-month-old sibling. There's an image of Sidra making the rounds on social media that is not even anything I can describe. There's a much better video. You can see Sidra running with her twin sister 12 hours before the bombing in a, this fluffy kind of tie-dye print rainbow-colored hoodie that looks identical to something my daughter wears. And her and her entire family were wiped out by a bombing that Israel admits was simply a diversion in order to rescue two hostages. They rescued two men, uh, one in their 60s, one in their 70s, from a, what they described as a civilian home. And that image that you see, that is simply a diversion from another mission to rescue two Israelis. So if anything ever demonstrated the fact that Palestinian life matters for nothing to these people, it's the fact that they will admit to bombing families in order to save two hostages. And I just can't even understand how Olivia Chow or Jagmeet or Justin or any of these fucks can spend time tweeting about the outside of the exterior of a hospital of which that entrance had been closed two hours prior to protesters arriving on scene. Yeah, it closes at like 6 p.m. every uh, every day. Yeah, all of our eyes should be on these, these children of Palestine, right? These people who have been squeezed now into tents, into refugee camps that have also been bombed. We've seen giant craters in the midst of, you know, your typical, if you envision a refugee camp tent, like as far as the eye can see, zero protection from shrapnel bombing these areas as well. And there's no health care for them. You imagine the aftermath of any kind of disaster and the injured there. There's no health care for them. So I don't give a fuck about folks who want to spend time trying to distract from that. Because frankly, everyone was watching the Super Bowl why this happened. Although, you know, the Super Bowl is already kind of a manufactured distraction for us all. Although people do need their entertainment, I get it. But this was really tough to reconcile with folks because I wasn't watching it. I have not watched the NFL for a long time because they're pieces of shit. But the audacity of the Israelis to air three commercials. So, you know, it's about seven million dollars a pop for a 30 second spot at the Super Bowl. They aired three commercials. One of them was trying to feed into the Super Bowl theme and talked about 138 seats were still waiting referring to hostages still being held by Hamas. Meanwhile, if you take a look at the stadium that you were watching, half of those people, they were Palestinians in Gaza, the ca and they represented the casualties, half of that stadium would be dead. And they're spending $7 million to remind you that there's 136 of them that are still being held in Palestine. And they get some Hollywood C-listers up there to play into it. The fact that there's a lot of people in Hollywood that are still like backing it. It's not surprising, but just it just gave the the Super Bowl an extra ick. Honestly, the fact that at the same time those ads are running that are trying to talk about anti-Semitism, they are bombing Sidra and her family literally to pieces. It's one of those things where they do this a lot, right? Where there's moments where they pick and choose when to put out certain statements like the whole UNRWA thing right after the ICJ ruling. You know, it's it's not a coincidence that uh, they were attacking Rafa during the Super Bowl, right? If we tried to label everything as a coincidence, then <laughs> you know how many coincidences there would be by now. I, I couldn't help but start thinking when we talk about this, about the trolley problem, right? You know, people like to debate the trolley problem online all the time, you know, as a, a, a test of morality. And I, I start wondering, like, for people who are trying to still justify this 
within the realms of their morality somehow. Like at what point? At what? Like how? How many Palestinian children are worth one hostage? You don't want to know that answer. I've been pretty burnt out this week, and I think it's just because, as much as we, we, you know, we try and focus on, on positive steps forward towards everything, just the the fact that we're we've been in this for like what 150 days or some shit, you know, and and we're still having like it's as if we're right at the beginning. Because it's as if people haven't learned a goddamn thing. That we're still having conversations with the same talking points. Like, it's so circular. We're going back and around and around in circles. And and and, and people don't realize. And it's, it's just like, fucking think. Sit down. Deconstruct your worldviews. Think about why you care about things. Why you justify things. What is it that you know? What do you think you know? Why do you think you know it? I'm so done appealing to those people, honestly, though. At this point, can you convince anybody who hasn't already been convinced that this is wrong? And why are there so many of those people? Or maybe there's not. I feel like we can't get a true gauge of how many people out there really understand what's happening and think that it's okay. We don't know because... Our exposure to media is definitely not the same. The amount of trolls online that, you know, sprung up October, November 2023, like that's a huge red flag. If you're engaging with someone like that, they're surely there just for this purpose. And there's clearly an army of them. I know we have that colonial imagination and I am worried to know those numbers, actually, you know. I, I want to think that they're not as high as they are being given weight in the media. But most people will hear the story that we started off with and believe it. Yeah. And they're thinking about that instead of what's actually happening. It's brought up a bit of a refreshed frustration of me with my role in journalism. Because it's like, yeah, I get it. I get that there's these these ethical codes that are supposed to apply to journalists, right? But th this is the problem with any ultimate hard principles when it comes to ethics and morality is that like, you know, at what point do we just forget the idea that people can be biased about something and we just like think like, how can we do the least harm? How can we try and prevent harm? Is it more important for me to be unbiased or is it more important for me to prevent harm? Like, I feel like it's such a discredit that we're the whole this side, that side of it all. It's like as if we're not capable of thinking critically and thinking deep and analyzing ourselves and figuring out where we stand about things. And I'm tired of being held to a different standard because I, like I'm, I'm exhausting myself here trying to prove that like I can I can be objective. I'm tired because I saw so many people there with cameras taking videos, different independent journalists I know, different, you know, the organizers themselves had cameras. And at the end of the day, a couple of tweets, a couple of articles, and the narrative goes to shit. You know, it's, it's so frustrating living in this propaganda state where it's so easy to manufacture the narrative. Like, like how do you take a horrible, horrible siege that is killing so many innocent people and you completely flip that story to attack on a hospital in Toronto. And how does the media even prioritize that story, right? Like, why is that showing up as an important thing for the media to talk about in their mind, right? Like, I want to know. You understand that an attack has begun on the most precarious spot of Palestine at the moment. And the situation there couldn't be more volatile. And there are responses coming in from around the globe. Ever shifting, you know, Canada's finally called for a ceasefire. Fuck you, you're still giving them weapons. But they're not centering that at all. They're centering this anti-Semitism that, yes, it exists. But why is that anyone's priority at the moment? Like, you want to talk about hospitals? Do you understand what triaging is? It's finding those who need our help fucking now, right now, like fucking 150 days ago now, like 75 fucking years ago now. Like, this is urgent, though. This is at, at a point now that there's no denying its urgency. Even the U.S., even Biden is like, whoa, be careful now. Right. Like he, that we've got the most we've ever gotten out of them now that they can see exactly what is in front of us. Right. It is about to happen. The worst of the worst. I, I think the 
the triaging point is a really good point, right? Because I think the ethics that apply in the medical world are the ethics that that I, I wish applied outside of it more. You know, the first do no harm. The, you know, you might not like someone, but you still got to save them. A commitment to just to the medicine, to to people's lives, and to to helping those who need who need it the most. I mean, obviously that doesn't apply to the states with their privatized systems. But you're starting to sound like a socialist. <laughs> Hopefully. Because right now, profit drives everything, right? Like, they aren't helping not because they're heartless individuals. I'm sure Trudeau loves his kids. His kids maybe has warm fuzzies. But these are dollars and cents to these people. They're risking dollars and cents and political capital, which just means capital. And I, I don't believe that they think that they're they're bad people and that they're in the wrong, right? They're finding ways to justify this to themselves. Don't say that. I need to know that those fuckers are not sleeping very well. Have you seen them? They're aging. I I need to know that this is bothering them because then I don't even understand humanity anymore, okay? Like, I can understand politics. I hate it, right? I, I get the games. Like, I can kind of wrap my mind around them. But I don't know how... Biden probably just doesn't even... I feel like he doesn't know what's going on he doesn't know what's going on but trudeau and like people are very very aware surely surely no i hope that they have to be medicated at this point the yelling and screaming everywhere they go you're killing babies like you know people are saying some really bad things to them all the time all the time more than normal and then on top of that they know they are getting more updates than we get. Yeah. And so he knows the level of death and destruction that he is responsible for and that they all play a hand in. I I don't know. I, I The fact that you might be right scares me that, that they can somehow reconcile this. They can distance themselves cognitively. But I hope they're paying a price mentally, honestly. Some. It's gonna sound, this is going to sound like a kind of out there reference, but I was... Um... Rewatching uh, Better Call Saul in the last little bit. And I was thinking about how, in many ways, the whole Breaking Bad cinematic universe is an exploration into moral justification. All of the different characters, there's so many times when, like, it's asking the audience to support something that might be morally wrong, but that we find different reasons through context or different things to justify. But then a different character that we don't have the same context does the same thing, and then you, you're you against them. And then someone who you think is good does something that you think is bad, and then you're torn, and then you're having to re... Like, the whole thing, I, I think that that's, like, at the very root of it, right, is, is exploring how do we come to justifications and how do we anyways i bring that up because like i think that it's a bit relative relevant here in the sense that there's so many ways to justify horrible things there's so many ways and the less that we think about it the easier it is to justify like the less that we really think and i think that you know Forget po- politicians are a, a bit of a lost cause, right? But what really gets me is like, I can't stop thinking about that one CP24 journalist who was there watching everything. And it's like, I, I, I wish I understood. I wish I knew what they were thinking about. Were they thinking about Rafa? Were they thinking about what it would be like for your apartment building to fall down on top of you without you having done anything to deserve that? Not that anybody deserves that. Like, were they thinking about what what it all even means? What it means to be somebody with a platform in a country built on genocidal colonialism in a moment when genocidal colonialism is taking place? Like, Most Canadians don't let that thought enter their brain. But, I mean, they still went out. There was a protest, emergency protest for Rafa, and they were there for four hours. They had a camera. They had a microphone. They recorded, they talked to people. And, and at what point is it like, I'm just here to do a job. I'm not thinking. I am a mindless robot and I need, oh, this person of high status put out this statement. So I must quote them. And this person here. And, oh, well, that's four statements. So I guess I don't need any more. And I shouldn't talk to the organizers. I know this is a bit of a chaotic rant and a bit out there but i just feel like i don't understand how there isn't conscient more conscientious objectors at what point do you just have a moment where 
you have something that's worth a little personal sacrifice and you stand up to your editor and you say, I understand that there's these rules that I've been following for years and that this is how things are supposed to be because that is the way that we've always done it. But I feel like maybe in this moment in time, these rules are not doing justice, our obligations as people. And my sense of humanity. And arguably to the purpose of the press in the first place. It was supposed to be a check and balance. What? It's supposed to be a watchdog. Right. And so if you are not checking, if you are not challenging politicians on their statements or the police on their statements, either by questioning them with knowledge that you have at your disposal because you were either there or because you're covering a fucking story on x so a little bit of research ahead of time is a responsibility but you know then we have folks come on and describe just the state of canadian media and the budgets that are allocated to journalism and that investigative journalists quite often or anything but if they're with the major outlets or reporting on a story that you know has been encouraged it's it's a sad state of i think affairs for all of canadian media and like all these factors play into this really weak representation because police will always have statements politicians always have statements like they have entire staffs dedicated to getting those out there and so that's that's low-hanging fruit for a really busy journalist, but trying to figure out what kafia wearing person with a megaphone is the person that will give you a statement, you know, that requires a little bit more work. And we're just not seeing that get done. The motivation's not there. You know, it's getting done by independent journalists, but not not those that are working for the, the, the outlets, reaching the people that we need to get a better idea of what's going on. And I mean, it's also like a little bit of just like it took them a while to get there, but... Remember how I mentioned that I got there really early, right? Uh, I was standing on a corner and I started talking to a Palestinian man there. We were just talking about life and he told me his Nakba story, right? About the tiny village in the north of uh, Palestine, close to the Lebanese border. And he told me about how the village beside his had been wiped out you know they went in with guns and and somebody escaped and went to his village and warned them and how because of that they were able to flee to lebanon and he told me about refugee camps and and life in lebanon and i was just thinking like are they having these con- like have they ever heard this i know like there's still people out here who who talk about oh the nakba didn't even happen you know all of these deniers and stuff and it's like just this simple conversation was such a devastating history, you know, and I, by pure coincidence that I even heard it in that moment, but it's not rare at the same time. It's, it's, it's not rare. You don't see the features that talk about that. You don't see Anna Lippman getting featured by the Toronto star to tell her story of protective presence in the West bank. Why not? That's a great story. You know, it, 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 like that was the type of thing that like in it's not rare in other conflicts you know it's definitely not rare in the ukraine conflict right you see these things it's kind of standard practice let's get an inside look on the ground what is it like i want to hear about the guy who who who's offering you know a pack of smokes i want to hear about the the playing soccer in in the backyard and trying to normalize things and the simple acts of hospitality and the simple date, like these are the things that like usually journalists get pretty excited about sharing, you know, L- let's humanize things. Let's show the human element. And there's been such little effort to humanize anything on the Palestinian side. There's no effort to demonstrate and, 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 to, and to make people wonder like, hey, let's paint everyone as humans and see what we think of it later. Let's see whether or not we're still justifying the same ratios of life to life and whether or not we're okay with anybody losing their life here. You know, that's supposed to be something that journalism does is try and humanize everything and then see what comes out of that. One of the people that I've been following in Gaza is Bisan. We've talked about Bisan before. She has evacuated to Rafa and it's been really obviously precarious. That's such a weak word, but for her and 
recently she uploaded an audio clip that kind of speaks to the Nekba and the likely prospect that this is a second Nekba. And that was always kind of the intent. But the fear you can hear in Basan's voice as she's hungry, she's sick, obviously very tired and and scared and feels them being pushed into the desert. And she fears, she talks about a real fear of being pushed out into the desert to starve with all of her people. And that is essentially what is happening right now. Satellite images confirm uh, what people on the ground have already been telling us for at least a week, that Egypt is building a barrier wall. They're building a pen in the desert that they are not commenting on, but we can only, this is miles, like a handful of miles from the Gaza border. And we can only imagine that this is exactly what they're doing, is going to push them out into the Sinai Desert at the remaining displaced people of Rafa, which would essentially then, that would be it for the Gaza Strip. Completely evacuated is not really the right word, but remove all the people of Gaza have will have been displaced at that point. And so this will not be the first time that this has happened to the Palestinians. And we've had guests on here talking before about how some Palestinians still hold the key from the home that they were driven from. And I imagine that is still the case here. Like, you've got to imagine those two million people from Gaza there, probably there's still part of them that want to go home. Like, you, some of them probably don't know the state of their house at this point. They're probably driven all the way from the north down to the south with no way of finding out if there is a home left for them, if they will be allowed to go home and they have absolutely no control over the situation whatsoever. And during all this and while the world is starting to, you know, voice concern and try to pressure Benjamin Netanyahu for restraint. And somehow he's supposed to protect the 1.6 million civilians in Rafa while still launching this campaign of bombing and ground assaults. But he speaks to the idea of a two-state solution or even the idea of Palestinians being granted statehood. And he calls that a gift that he doesn't want to give them. Like a single man thinks that it's his position to deny an entire people's statehood. And in reality, he is. And that's so fucked up. There is some people reporting on the wall being built in Egypt and the prospect of what's happening there. And I think once that does gain traction in Canadian media, I believe they will try to spin it as some sort of good thing that Egypt is building a refugee camp to save the people of Rafa. And we won't be able to say that we didn't know that this was happening all along. Honestly, all, all those media figures that you're talking about, I don't care about the pressures that they're under. I don't give a fuck. The fact that this can happen on your watch and not be front page news is a complete failure of the entire entire Canadian media. All we can do is just try to tell as many of these stories as we possibly can. And all you can do, hopefully, is perhaps share them and keep telling them, as well as tag up with the Palestinian youth movement in your area. Labor for Palestine has just opened an Ottawa chapter. They are all across Canada as well. I don't know when this episode will air, but surely there's an action happening in your area. If you have not done anything as to date, you need to start doing it now. There is no time left to wait. That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. Also, a very big thank you to the producer of our show, Santiago Halu Quintero. Blueprints of Disruption is an independent production operated cooperatively. You can follow us on Twitter at BP of Disruption. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo, please share our content. And if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.